We take up the incarnation of our beloved Lanello as the scribe of Peter, surnamed John Mark. I like to think of the Santa Barbara Mother House as the House of Mark. We are delighted to receive the transfer of the great vision that Mark held in his heart of Jesus Christ. It is unique. The foretaste of it is in Zechariah 3, 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. The theme and the scope and the purpose of the work of the Book of Mark are very evident by its contents. In the Book of Mark, as in no other book, we see Jesus as the mighty worker rather than as the unique teacher. Mark is known as the gospel of Jehovah's servant, the branch, prophesied in Zechariah 3, 8, which I just read to you. Jehovah's servant, the branch. This is the exact teaching that we have received from Mark in this age. Jehovah, or Yahweh, I am that I am, is the appearance of Sanat Kumara unto Moses for all of the tribes of Israel, all of the seed of Abraham. Every avatar who comes to earth, east and west, is the servant of Yahweh. It is God personified, and we know that personified God to be Sanat Kumara. The disciples were looking for the one who would be Yahweh's servant. And the only one whom they could call Lord would be the one who was that servant by the very fact that he himself had received the visitation of the mighty I Am Presence and walked the earth as the embodiment of the I Am Presence. This is why Jesus was both Lord and Savior. Lord is the English version of the four letters Y-H-V-H. Lord is always written in the Old Testament in place of the word Yahweh, which is in place of the word I am that I am. You can see Lord written over and over again in the sacred scriptures. And each time it is written, you may say, I am that I am, Sanat Kumara. I am that I am is the impersonal name of God, Sanat Kumara becomes the personalization or the individualization of the mighty I Am Presence. Therefore, the one who then becomes the embodiment of the I Am Presence has the right to be called Lord, or the one who is the bearer of I Am that I Am. They were looking for the Lord, and they were looking for the Savior. So where does Mark find him but in the one who is the perfect servant of Sanat Kumara? Jehovah's servant, the branch. The branch indicates the bow that extends from your I Am Presence. The branch of Jehovah is the personal Christ, hence the Son of God. His servant, the branch, Zechariah 3, 8. It's important to know this. John Mark never met Jesus Christ. Perhaps he saw him at the Last Supper, which may have been held in his mother's home. He gained what he wrote from Peter, from Paul, and the other apostles. He was a scribe. 
He was a young boy when Jesus was finishing his mission. Mystically, through the very person and presence of Jesus Christ, as well as through the auras of Peter and Paul, he gained this insight. Jehovah's servant, the branch. The one who is Jehovah's servant because Christ, the branch, lives in him and he does incarnate the word, I am that I am. He was called John Mark, and he was the son of one of the New Testament Marys, as well as the nephew of Barnabas. He was an associate of the apostles and is mentioned in the writings of Paul and of Luke, Luke in the book of Acts. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. That is in Acts 12. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Then again, we find in Acts 15, 37, 39. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Here we have Paul the Apostle apparently determining that Mark needs discipline because on an earlier journey, for whatever reason, Mark left off from being with them. Barnabas, his uncle, disagreed. And therefore there was a, di a division among uh, these two because of it, and they went their ways, Mark going with Barnabas. When you study the book of Acts and you read the letters of the Apostle Paul, you realize that in the absence of Jehovah's servant, the branch, in physical embodiment, dissensions were not easily settled. Disputes arose, each one felt that they had equal authority under Jesus Christ, Peter having been with him, Paul having been anointed, and therefore their differences continued. And the resolution, as we know, only comes when one who is present is acknowledged as a higher authority. While Jesus was with them, he settled their disputes. Now, as you know, the mantle of the inner church and of the mother as guru fell upon Mother Mary with the ascension of Jesus. But the outer building fell upon Peter, and Paul himself had the very special anointing to go and preach to the Gentiles and was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus. So they each had their own position and their own anointing, John himself being the beloved. And so none felt that any other was a greater authority, for they each had had direct contact with Jehovah's servant. So this becomes a very interesting point if you follow it for 2,000 years. You realize that there is the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, there is the authority of apostolic succession through the popes, and then the authority of the, of the bishops and the priests. And then there are those who have had very special visitations and visions, some of them certainly authentic by the Holy Spirit with direct contact with Jesus, and some of them false hierarchy. On the basis of this, Martin Luther left the Catholic Church, and certainly hundreds if not thousands of Protestant sects have been formed, and within the Church, holy orders have been given because a particular saint, like St. Saint Francis, received a commission from the Lord, told it to the Pope, 
The Pope felt it was consistent with dogma, consistent with the original teaching, and therefore gave permission for an order to be formed. Usually these holy orders are founded upon a saint's meditation upon some passage of scripture which he wishes to emphasize and dedicate a group of followers to. So there is room for individual vision and always has been within the Roman Catholic Church. It's very interesting when I talked to the Monsignor with the Kehoes that I explained to him the vision I had had and that I considered our organization a holy order within the true church and that because I did not expect that uh, this vision or this order would be accepted by the Pope that here I was outside of the Catholic Church instead of within it and in all previous embodiments or many of course I have been within the church. Uh, it is not my choice of course it is the Ascended Master's choice to have us outside of, of the church but the interesting thing was that I could not provide the Monsignor with any real excuse that he found acceptable as to why I should not be within the church, whether I spoke to him of Gautama Buddha or of Confucius or various beliefs. Uh, he felt that the, the expansiveness and the tolerance of the church should be able to contain it, largely because he felt the Holy Spirit and he felt our devotion to the Virgin Mary. In afterthought and in retrospect, I don't think he agrees with himself. <laughs> but in the presence of the Spirit that was his opinion. So when we read this little portion in Acts, we see how divisions arise and how they remain, each one feeling that from the point of his own conscience and his own witness of the Lord that he is right. Well, obviously, the Ascended Masters are not in disagreement, but often there is value and truth to differing witnesses of the same central Son. And if these cannot be harmonized by the living Word, by a messenger incarnate, then you have the fragmentation of the body of God, which is most unfortunate. In Colossians 4, 10, we read, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. This is a letter from Paul to the Colossians, making reference to Mark. In 2 Timothy 4, we read, as Paul writes his letter to Timothy, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Here you can hear that Paul has had a change of heart and that uh, he now appreciates the worth of the service of Mark. In Philemon 24, we read, There salute thee, Epapras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. It is an admonishment to salute these ones. Thus we have a picture that, with the going forth of the apostles, Mark is there, is in their midst, is an eyewitness, and these few passages do therefore give us a certain authenticity to the book that we are about to study. As we will see, there is a great authenticity to this book. John Mark then was the son of one called Mary of Jerusalem. He is the companion and the scribe of the early missionaries. He is listed as the probable author of the Gospel of Deeds. As we have said, this is the Gospel that applies to the one who is servant more than any other role that Jesus Christ was. Whence comes the symbol of Mark, the evangelist, as a winged lion, the second living creature beheld by Ezekiel in his vision of the glory. The second Gospel, the second living creature. The lion of Saint Mark is a wonderful symbol as you know, in astrology, the lion is the symbol of Leo, which is the sign of the heart. You often see the pierced lion as the symbol of sacrifice. If you ever go to Lucerne, Switzerland, you will see a magnificent lion carved in stone, a pierced lion, symbol of the sacrificial nature of the laying down of one's life for the country. I always like to have uh, that emblem or that shield of lion 
and you may choose to have it also in your home if you ever come upon that symbol. It is a worthy one and of course we think of the roaring lion of our own beloved Mark and that to him was a Buddhist exercise given to him by the Hindu by the name of El Moria Khan. So the lion is indeed a universal symbol of strength and self-sacrifice and of the works of God. John was his Jewish name. Mark or Marcus, M-A-R-C-U-S, was his Roman name in keeping with the custom of Hellenistic Jews of this time. John meaning God is gracious, which means upon this place, upon this servant, the grace or the light of Yahweh descends. Marcus is from the Latin meaning a large hammer, which is truly the symbol of the hammering forth of the word. Mark is an artisan. He was and is this artisan. The hammering out of the word, himself in action, he perceives his Savior in action. When we first meet him, he is living at Jerusalem, apparently in the home of his mother Mary. She appears to have been a widow of some means, inasmuch as she described in Acts, she is described in Acts as the owner of a house spacious enough to accommodate a large Christian gathering and as having the services of a maid. It has been suggested that the Last Supper was held in her home and that John as a boy may have witnessed some of the final events of Jesus' life. When we came to La Tourelle, I told you, Montessori students, when we were there, that I selected the uh, mural of the Last Supper by Philippe de Champagne rather than the more well-known one because it has the, in the foreground the back of the boy, Mark, clearing the dishes away. He looks like more than a boy. He looks like a teenager, perhaps 13 or 14. He is strong and he is there. And he figures in the scene as a presence of strength. And because he is younger than the rest, he symbolizes the future of that which is to come, the ministry. After the supper is over, the dishes are cleared. Of course, the Lord is blessing the bread, and that is what it shows in the mural, and the wine. But supper is over, and it's the concept, let us be up and doing. And the let us be up and doing part is there in the person of Mark, himself the servant. To me, it is wonderful to contemplate this particular point of the servant because this is what I saw and witnessed in Mark Prophet. He was ever the servant, and he taught me to be the servant, the servant of the Christ in all. Not to be exalted, not to have self-glory, not to take up the importance, the self-importance of one's position, but to remember that one has the greatest light in order to serve the greatest light, and one must become the most humble with that light in order to remain the servant of Yahweh. There is conjecture. I myself cannot give witness to this, but it is mentioned a number of times that the young man who fled away naked in the Garden of Gethsemane was John, John Mark, that he was serving as caretaker of the family garden, and that, that, that at the time of the arrest of Jesus, he had been sleeping there in the watchtower. When the guard attempted to arrest him, he ran off, leaving only his garment, a linen cloth, in the soldier's hands. That is conjecture. Mary seems to have been intimately acquainted with St. Peter, as it was to her house that he repaired after his deliverance from prison. This fact could account for Mark's intimate acquaintance with Peter. Now we have the record of John, John Mark, in Acts. He was taken by them on their first missionary journey as an assistant. Barnabas and Paul arrived at Jerusalem to bring alms from the Christians in Antioch to the Christians in Judea during the famine of A.D. 45. They needed an assistant and it is likely that it was Barnabas who chose his young cousin, cousin or nephew, Mark. 
We read the occasion when Paul is represented as instructing Timothy to bring him Mark, for he is very useful in serving me. I cannot think of a greater approbation upon an aspiring Chila than to be thought of as useful and to be remembered as needed, to be remembered as the right hand of the one who is the principal servant. The person who can be the right hand of the one who is serving may very well be the one who is called ultimately to sit on the right hand of God. The right hand of God is the position of Christ. Thus, to be the servant is to move forward toward that position. I have seen El Moria discipline here and there, Sheila's on the way, and I remember one occasion in his disciplining of a young woman who came to serve, who had been very capable in the world, on her own, on a job, was called and asked to work for us, and everything to which she put her hand, she failed. Caused much strife and burden in my editorial department, and caused us double and triple work, having to not only teach her how to do her work, not only to do it for her, but also to deal with this vibration of discord. Ultimately, it was very apparent by this failure syndrome that really, what she was telling us psychologically was, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here under these disciplines, so I'm going to fail until I fail so many times that you will get the message and put me out. So Elmoria came along one day after she herself had devised a plan of, of how she would leave and what she would do uh, without any prompting from me. And uh, she sought to have this plan of going forth and doing this and that in the world ratified by Almoria. So it was then that I heard this very stunning and stinging rebuke of Almoria, who told her that the reason of her failure and her cons consistent failure was that she had said in her heart, if I do well, I will be called upon to serve more and I'll be stuck here the rest of my life. He exposed that entire consciousness, stripped from her the garments of her pseudo-self, and rebuked her. She admitted that it was true. She admitted that it was true. And I've seen it happen in a number of occasions. I have seen people say, if I do a good job, I'll be asked to do another good job and another, and I'll be hooked into staff life, and I'll never get out of here as long as I live. Well, this is the point of John Mark's service, and it is the point of Jesus' service. There's a very simple motto of the Brotherhood. The reward for service is more service. And in the world it goes, if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. Service begets service, and you need to deal with this squarely when you meet Mark Prophet. Mark Prophet was honest, outspoken, more outspoken than you can even imagine, because he would speak out on the hidden things of the aura. He would speak to people of what was right there lurking beneath the surface. Whereas in diplomatic circles, diplomatic circles and with the f violet flame, we sometimes provide the grace of Kuan Yin that covers over people's faults and we don't expose them. But with a certain gentleness and grace, we deal with people and we supply to them what is missing. So it takes a certain and particular facet of consciousness, a deportment, a focusing in on a certain work that God wishes to do with people to expose what is beneath that surface for their own good. As I have wondered, and perhaps you have wondered, why it is that all of you came in after the ascension of our beloved Mark. The first and foremost answer, of course, is that except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it cannot 
uh, grow. It will not grow. It will not expand. It will not give forth its essence. So unless there is the ascension of the Son of God in the midst of the nucleus of disciples, there is not the worldwide expansion because that light is necessary. It is absolutely essential and necessary for one Son of God and then many sons of God to take the ascension so that the fireworks of the descent of the Holy Spirit, all of those points of light become seeds that will actually quicken hearts throughout the planetary body. This is why the mission of Jesus Christ began to expand the very day of Pentecost. The Son of God ascends, 40 days later, down comes the Holy Spirit, and immediately 3,000 are converted, and the, the apostles go forth. So that is true concerning our own beloved Mark Prophet. But there is another point that is true also, that many who have come afterward could not have taken him in his concentrated self, in his very honesty of exposure. And that is a point that we all have to deal with because these subtleties do not want to be uncovered. And he would roar at you until there was nothing left to hide. And if indeed this story is true about the boy who runs away, it is prophetic of his entire ministry to his ascension. He himself was stripped of his garment in fleeing, and if you're going to flee into the arms of the Lord, you will have to be stripped of your garment, even your linen garment, and stand naked just as Jesus Christ stood naked before the fallen ones. So Mark was very good at doing this. And above all, he trains us in the path of service. So when you meet and have the confrontation with Yahweh's servant, Mark, you will have to reckon in your being with your willingness, your ability, your real desire and will to serve in the capacity of Yahweh's servant, Yahweh's best servant, and accept your appointing and your anointing. I have seen people timid about entering their path. I've seen someone very famous timid about entering their path. Does anyone know who I'm referring to? I'm referring to Jesus. He was at the marriage at Cana of Galilee. There was a drama. It's like when the trumpets blow and you're ready for your performance. As soon as the music starts playing, you've got your cues and you've got to be on stage. Well, Jesus' cue was the marriage at Cana. He'd spent 30 years traveling around the world, probably being educated as a young man, in the British Isles, went to India, went to Luxor, went throughout the Near East, traveled on foot by land, I understand, and so passed through and for, perhaps was acquainted with the traditions of Zoroaster, Zarathustra. Considering who and what Jesus Christ was, you can be certain that from the age of 12 to 30, he had learned all that was worth learning on the surface of the earth and in the inner temples. You can consider that he had at least five PhDs by the time he was at the marriage at Cana. So that was his cue on stage. He knew it. He knew every event that would follow until his crucifixion. And his mother gave him direction, chided him a little, and he rebuked her and said, what have I to do with thee? She calmly said to the people that were there, whatever he tells you to do, do it. He composed himself, went into his heart and said, bring me the pots of water. Thus he demonstrates the alchemy, changing the water into wine, which is the entire purpose of his mission. He comes for transmutation. The water of our human consciousness is not acceptable. We need the Savior and we need the Lord so that we can become the essence of God, the wine of the Spirit. In that condition, we ourselves will one day celebrate the marriage of our soul to the living Christ. So the reticence to begin the mission has been with the greatest of the saints and saviors. Gautama Buddha, as Siddhartha, had all of the things of this life in the world, 
He had marriage, he had a son, and it was only when he was impelled, when he could not resolve the inner fire with the outer conditions that he left. It was painful. He left without ceremony. He did not say goodbye to his wife and son. He left in the middle of the night while they were sleeping, as we are told. So don't, do not think that you are unworthy if you have a bit of a hesitancy or a concern to start the mission. You all have a mission. We will be crystal clear with truth today in the mantle of Mark. You do have a mission. Your anointed self is there, and when the outer self realizes the fullness of that word with you, you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do something on this planet that no one else can do. And this is what you must remember. No one else can do your job or your work. No one. And if you do not do it, it will leave a tear in the net, the great fisherman's net. And how many holes are going to be in that net and who will mend them? Typically, the cosmic virgin must mend the nets. So when the great fisherman casts out the net in the sea of life and fish get through the holes, who is accountable? Ultimately, there is an accountability. Some of you will minister to a few. Some of you will minister to tens and hundreds and others to thousands. All of you can minister through millions as you take your stand anywhere on earth, being a pillar of fire, doing your daily decrees, and embodying the teachings, giving forth that word. As you support the publishing arm of this movement, you have the good karma of serving millions. Service, then, is something we must be reckoned with. There is a time in our life, as Mark Prophet has told us in his excellent lecture, a time to be selfish so that later we can be generous. You need to understand that part of your life. A time to go and get educated as Jesus did. We can say he was selfish for 30 years so he could be generous for three. That is placing one's attention on the great God self, on one's inner self, and developing that self. There's no point going forth on a mission with nothing to give, with no selfhood defined. We must take care that we do not pursue self-centered interests for the sake of the self. We pursue self-centered interests to the glory of God ultimately. But we are wise. We understand with Ecclesiastes there's a time to sow. There's a time for the crops to germinate in the summer. There's a time for a harvest. And there's a time for latency. So understanding the cycles of life, you work and you work hard to prepare yourself. And it is always the sense of preparing oneself to be ready when called. When you are going to be called to be ready. So you never know when you are ready. Only God decides when we are ready. Some people think they're ready ahead of time because they're very eager and they're like fools who rush in where angels fear to tread. They think they can just march right out and convert the world. Then there are others who think they are never ready. They can study and learn and prepare, and they may be 50, and they still think they're not quite ready for their mission. So God decides. Jesus decided when Mark Prophet was ready in this life. He decided when John Mark was ready in that life, and so on. And you know the discussion which Mark tells us about that he had with Jesus, listing and enumerating to Jesus how he was not prepared, not tutored, not this and not that, and the simple answer Jesus gave him, which was certainly one not calculated to puff up his pride. He said, well, if I waited till you were perfect, it would be all over. <laughs> so he let him go on in his own sense of imperfection to keep him striving, but he let him know he needed him now, and his preparation at the present moment was adequate. So I kind of think that we're all adequate to do something. And you, you sense that feeling of adequacy next to the inadequacy of people who have nothing. When you have a garment, you have something to give. If you have a single coat, you can give it away. 
If you know a, a certain portion of the teaching, go ahead and teach it to someone. Because whoever doesn't know it, that makes you the guru and then the chila, right? So there's always a teacher and a pupil relationship, and sometimes the roles immediately reverse, and the person you just told the story to turns right around and tells you something you didn't know. So John Mark acted as a teacher as well as a travel secretary. It's very important to be able to be a secretary because you might become the amanuensis of El Moria or Kifumi. When I was preparing and very much in the full burning in my heart of the preparation that I would need for whatever I was to do, which I did not know when I was in school, I was called to study political science, history, and economics, and languages. But I also felt that I had to become a good secretary. And I was in college, and I had uh, plenty to do. And my advisors kept saying to me, what in the world do you want to become a secretary for? You can uh, go off and have your own secretary. Go ahead and get a couple of degrees, and you, know, you can hire a secretary. You don't need to become a secretary. Well, that didn't satisfy me. So when I went on a co-op job from Antioch College to New York, I was working at the United Nations as an assistant to the delegate's private photographer, which enabled me to meet thousands of people personally in, inside of three months, which was interesting. But I took a night school and took a complete secretarial course in shorthand, typing, business, and so forth. And there didn't seem to be any purpose to it. Well, when I arrived in Washington, believe it or not, Mark Prophet did not own a dictating machine. I was the one who introduced to him his first IBM dictating machine. And it was so expensive, uh, according to our standards in those days, that he, he uh, scolded me for bringing it home on demonstration for him to see. Ultimately, we got a dictating machine, and thereafter, Mark Prophet dictated the pearls into a dictating machine. Prior to that, he was still John Mark the scribe. He typed the dictations on a manual typewriter. That's how I found him when I came. Sat down. He said, I'm going to go take a pearl. He goes sit down in the typewriter and hack out the pearl from El Moria. So you see, it's a good thing he learned how to type himself. So I came along, and I could take shorthand. So whatever he said, I took down in shorthand notes. And that was the driving force that said I had to be a secretary. So that is a very important process because there are things that you hear and will keep on record that no one will ever have uh, in the course of your travels, in the course of your work. As you go stumping, events happen, people are converted. As you write down your account, it becomes part of the body of literature for the Aquarian age of what happened in those first years when the first dispensation went forth of the Aquarian age. We have four Gospels today and some ap apocryphal material that is not necessarily accepted. But, but the a volume of Christian literature giving accounts of the period is really quite scarce. Today there is no need for it to be scarce. What there is a need for is it to be accurate. Because you have the eyewitness accounts, and then you have the accounts of those who are in the media, and their newspaper chronicles, and then you have the accounts of the betrayers. So if you don't have the accounts of those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, you can have an historical account of an event such we as are, we are experiencing, which is jaded, which does not really give the real facts as they were and as they happened. Okay, John Mark, then, was a secretary. If you want to pick up the mantle of each of the incarnations of Lanello, you cannot overlook this. He did menial tasks cleared tables, washed dishes, took care of the clothes of the apostles, did all the little details that enabled them to get up and speak. It's very important training. Some people think, well, I don't have time to do that. I'm going to go out and do this and that and do something important. But those little steps are like the steps of Montessori school. They're the building blocks. They're the foundation. They give you the confidence, all the while you are receiving the mantle of the one who has gone before you. At Perga in Pamphylia, when they were about to enter upon the more arduous part of their mission, Mark, as I told you, left the apostles, and for some unexplained reason returned to Jerusalem, to his mother, and to his home. 
It was then that we read the passage from Acts. In A.D. 51, Barnabas and Paul resolved to set out on a second mission and journey. On this occasion, Paul resolutely declined to associate himself again with one, quote, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. The issue was a sharp contention, which resulted in the separation of Paul from his old friend Barnabas, who, taking Mark with him, returned to Cyprus while Paul proceeded through Syria and Cilicia. Whatever the cause of Mark's vacillation, if indeed it was vacillation, it did not lead to a final separation between him and Paul. Less than 10 years later, Mark shared Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Imagine being in prison with Hilarion. A.D. 61 to 63, and he is acknowledged by Paul as one of his few fellow laborers unto the kingdom of God, who had been a comfort to him during the weary hours of his imprisonment. In Peter's first epistle, Mark is referred to as Peter's son. The phrase, my son, offers evidence of close attachment between Peter and Mark. Truly a spiritual son, and therefore trusted. And that trust relationship is the foundation of the Guru-Chila relationship. And to me, this is why we find very unique writings in the book of Mark and very frank statements about Peter himself, which no doubt were learned from Peter as well as the other apostles. Ecclesiastical tradition affirms that St. Mark visited Egypt, founded the church at Alexandria, and became its first bishop, Bishop of Alexandria. You will recall that in the early centuries, Hypatia was also in Alexandria and occupied the philosopher's chair, inheriting that from her father. This was one of my own incarnations. It was the Christian monks who murdered Hypatia. And here was Mark, the bishop of Alexandria. So for the reason of the descent of our twin flames in Egypt, Ekenaten and Nefertiti and so forth, there we were positioned again in the early centuries for the reason of the Temple of Luxor, for the reason of the Ascension Temple. It's very interesting, the, the garments that we wear. You received a dictation that stated that your counterparts could be found inside of Russia. You may find out one day that your twin flame is in Russia or in Red China today, and that you are holding the flame of light on opposite sides of the spectrum. I would not say this if it were not true, because it, were not, it is not in my heart to deliver it to you. So it comes from the I Am Presence and from Lanello, and it applies to you personally, some of you who are gathered here. And if you feel a certain fervor in your being to study Russian or to work with Russian people, it may be that you feel that calling for the liberation of souls and ultimately for the union with that flame. This is why it's very important to trust your heart and your soul and something that keeps on coming back to you. When it comes back again and again in odd situations or when you're meditating or you find yourself somewhere and again there's this gnawing inside of you to take a journey somewhere, to do this, to do that, you find that life is a succession of crossroads. And if you follow the leadings of the inner voice, and follow them meticulously, you will take the next step in your path. Now, God does not allow our personal disobedience to ultimately take us from our mission, but sometimes we delay ourselves. I would like to tell you an incident in my life of my own procrastination of obedience of the Master when I was a student at Boston University. I was in the midst of a five-year search for the Great White Brotherhood and for St. Germain. I had the books. I could not find a single living soul who had ever heard of St. Germain or the Ascended Masters. This is quite extraordinary considering that the I Am movement had had at least a million members at one time. The extraordinary thing, of course, is that St. Germain did not want me to meet 
any student of the Ascended Masters or affiliate with any organization because he wanted me to get to Mark first and not to any other activity and get lost in that activity and never come out of it. Well, I was in Boston and my search was intensifying and I was quite sure that I must be of all people the most sinful because I was not acceptable unto St. Germain because he was not contacting me and I was not finding the, the focus. So I kept on striving with a, a, a tremendous striving uh, of my being to um, whittle away at my whatever personal flaws I might see and to, to serve in a very dedicated way at the uh, university as well as the church where I was attending, which was the Christian Science Church. So I was involved in a lot of activities, uh, desiring to serve God where I might so that he would find me in his service and take me to a higher service. Well, this is an amazing thing. Uh, I had my books, of course, covered in brown paper, and I had written the saying on my books, Obey Immediately. And I noticed in my own personal life that I would hear the voice of God and that the most important thing for me to do when I would hear the voice of God was to obey that voice, speaking to me directly and with great power. Because each time I would obey the voice of God and do something, it would be a key leading me to another situation and another situation where ultimately I was putting on the mantle of the Lord. I was expanding consciousness. I was meeting people. I was learning things. I was studying. Each time I would be obedient, another door would, would open. So I thought, if doors open when you obey God, then you ought to obey immediately. So I decided that was the biggest thing I had to learn. So in spite of the fact that I had this written all over my book so that I would have to have my eyes rest on it no matter to what class I was going, I would go down a certain street and come around a certain corner and I would have to hop in the subway to get to BU to attend my classes. And so every time I was passing that corner, I was in a hurry because I just allowed myself the exact amount of time and no more uh, to get out of bed in the morning and be on time to my first class. And so every time I would get to this door, I would get the prompting, go inside. And I'd look inside that door, and it was kind of a dingy, dingy old place, and uh, there was just a hallway and an elevator, and uh, it, was an, it was an old business building, and it had a list on the, on the, uh, near the elevator of the offices that were upstairs. So I said, okay, one of these days I'll go in. But I didn't go in. <laughs> Because every day I would be charging around the corner, down the, uh, down the subway, and, and off to school. So I never actually went in that door. Can you believe this? I never went in the door. Well, quite some time later, when, by a, a great roundabout way, I finally found the group of students of the Ascended Masters in Boston, and Mark Prophet was coming to speak. And I uh, was going to go and hear him speak, uh, I had already been to their little sanctuary where they were holding their meetings uh, after I had found them. And it was actually, I think it was at least a year later uh, that, that uh, I had to wait a whole other year because of this. Um, the first time I went to the place, I followed the address and I went there. And you guessed it, it was in that door. <laughs> and I walked in the door of that building that I had passed so many times. And on that roster of names, uh, by the elevator, it said, Ascended Master Sanctuary. <laughs> so I would have walked in and read the thing and probably camped there until somebody arrived <laughs> and found uh, the students of the Ascended Masters a year earlier. And that next year, it's very interesting, I had to go through a, a, a very particular karmic situation. And uh, later, St. Germain told me that if I had not gone through that karmic situation, I could not have been trained to be a messenger, that it was a certain karma that I had to balance. And he also told me through Mark that uh, I was not scheduled to come in to the activity or to be trained for another nine years, nine whole years after I found Mark. I found Mark when I was about 22. And so... Uh, the demanding and the searching and the calling out to God and the making of the commitment to God, I will serve you, come and get me, St. Germain, precipitated that earlier meeting along with the necessities of Mark's own life, the divine plan of the United States, and ultimately the necessity for him to take his ascension. 
So we find in that set of experiences karma, the necessity of karma being balanced before one can enter upon one's mission. We find cosmic timetables involved. We find our own obedience factor. We find God determining to prepare us and not plucking us from the field, not picking us until he has sufficiently prepared us and we are prepared. So all things working together, you might say that perhaps it was not my procrastination that caused that year's delay because it seemed like an unrelenting hand of God that was keeping me in finishing up the certain things I had to do, which also involved a certain maturing of my being, a certain ripening of the soul. Because when I met Mark, this was the confrontation of the guru and the chila. This was the dismantling of the human personality and a very intense now three-year period of training. So I had to be ready and willing to be taken apart and put back together again without resistance. And I think that that's very important. What is important about our education and our training is that, one, we develop the inner identity of God and Christ and soul within us. We develop an inner communion with our I am presence upon which we learn to rely. We discipline ourselves. We look at ourselves and we say, I don't like that. Let's get rid of that. And we put ourselves through a certain course, a certain discipline in order to remove those things. So the will is already engaged when one meets the guru. The will already says, I want what you've got. I want to be taken apart. I want to be stripped of this human consciousness and I want to serve. Well, the I want in me became very pronounced. For five years, I was wanting Saint Germain. For five years, I was waiting to be filled. For five years, I was hungry and thirsty. And the hunger and the thirst and the intensity began to exclude everything else in my life. There was no more all-consuming passion in my life than finding Saint Germain. So the ingredients were there. The rolling momentum of self-discipline, the internalization of God, the will to do whatever God required, a certain world awareness that saw the burden of the planet and said, I have to do something about it. I'm the only one that can do that something about it that has to be done that is my inner calling, whatever it is. And finally, the willingness to receive a teacher. The willingness to receive Mark Prophet in whatever way he was going to dish out whatever it was that he was going to dish out. So I suddenly was taken up to be his companion and secretary, disciple, and one who would be trained to be a messenger. So I was with him constantly and basically with no one else as I left Boston and I went forth for this. And it demanded everything I had of, of my earlier life, of my self-discipline, to meet that standard and to meet it so suddenly. All of a sudden being told, you must be trained, you are going to be the messenger, you have to shape up, you have to transmute your human karma, you've got to kick out the, the residual substance of the human ego. There was no time. El Moria and Mark made this very emphatic. Mark was going on to higher service. He was going to take his leave of the planet. He told me this the very first week I met him, that he had already been called home by the Father and he was waiting and actively looking for the person to whom he was going to transfer the mantle of the messenger. So it was not the kind of situation where, take it or leave it, you want to take 10 years to study the teachings, fine, you know, if you want to take the rest of your life when you're 65, you can become a messenger. It was take it now or get out. Receive it today or we don't have time to fool around with you. So that's the way it was. It was, it was a very great challenge. And that's how Moria is. He says, if you want to be trained by me, you've got to be ready to have radical surgery all at once. If you don't like that idea, you can go and, and uh, put yourself under another one of the Chohans. Paul the Venetian or Lanto, they will give you an adjusted course which extends over, over many, many years and sometimes many lifetimes. So you have to have the necessary ingredient and the necessary alchemy 
And I think that the great rejoicing of my soul is that God did delay me five years in finding Mark Prophet. Because five years earlier, I don't think that I would have been ready to take the fire of his being. I have to say that in all honesty. Five years earlier, I was 18. I had just graduated from high school and I was going off to Antioch College. If I had been taken then, I wouldn't have had a college education, which taught me a lot because I, I studied philosophy, world religions, political science, the whole worldview. I mean, I learned a lot of things that just basic background material that you need to know to understand how the Ascended Masters are commenting on the world scene. And I think emotionally and psychologically, I would not have been prepared for the announcement of such an important mission. So I don't want you to think that my testimony is, means that you must immediately decide today to jump into the fire with Zarathustra, nor should you uh, deduce from it that uh, you can take five or ten years to get ready to jump into the fire. But somewhere between the two, you need to position yourself, you need to understand yourself, you need to have compassion for yourself at the same time that you deal firmly with the false fears of the idolatrous and pseudo-human personality. Position yourself vis-a-vis -vis the encounter. You've all had a certain encounter. You've all heard certain stories. You've seen the example of other chilas. When you come to SU or MI, you're still basically observers. You're not really in the fire. You get into the disciplines. You give the decrees. You hear the teachings and so on. But Nobody's ready to scalp you. Nobody's ready to really strip you of your garments. You can observe how it happens, study the process, and then come to that inner integration when those elements are all converging together. And you have to feel a certain inner strength to get on this roller coaster of the path. You have to feel a strength that is the coordinate of the master's strength. And when you feel that you can deal on a one-to-one -one basis with the messenger or the master, when you have enough of that God that can take anything, then you can walk on to higher initiation. I would like to tell you that in my initiations of today, this very day, I have to find and affirm a new and greater strength to deal with other hierarchs, other beings, and other disciplines. It never ends. One never reaches, reaches a plateau. I have to find this very day a certain coordinate of strength so that I can deal with a certain design and plan that comes to me from the God star Sirius that is translated to my soul. And I have to overcome whatever may be lacking or wanting in me to confirm that strength so that I can say, Yea, Lord, I am ready for this mantle. I'm ready to move on with it, and I am here, and the light that you send down will not crush me by its very intensity. But I will stand, I will still stand, and I am saying that I feel your mantle upon me as my mantle of capability. I feel the ability and the capability now to move on with this particular project. I'm ready for the world's censure. I'm ready for the world's condemnation. I'm ready to take the anti-light against this and against your light. And that's how you move on in succeeding relationships with the hierarchy. Starting with Mark Prophet is starting with a master, a wonderful father, a wonderful friend, the great lover of your soul, a very, very compassionate heart, but someone who is not going to indulge your human nonsense. And that is a wonderful thing and someone who is not going to kid you or flatter you and yet can be very kind and very complimentary and tell you what is good about you and tell it to you with the, with the greatest love and devotion. So here we have, coming through these pages on Mark the Evangelist, the understanding that our twin flames have held and must continue to hold the balance of the light in Egypt for Serapis Bay, for the path of the Ascension. His, mar his book of Mark being the book of deeds, the book of works, 
it shows you the direct, correct, the direct connection to Luxor, that if you are going to ascend, you must have the works and the words of the Master. Inherent in this whole understanding is you can become the servant of Yahweh as Jesus was if you will follow in his footsteps. If you will be the servant and do the works that he does, so you also can do the greater works. So Mark, above all people, is giving you in his gospel the path of the ascension by not making Jesus so far removed from yourself. He is the one who sets the example of works. Mark met with a similar fate in Alexandria, similar fate to Hypatia. The heathens in Alexandria called him a magician. Now, Hypatia was killed by fundamentalist Christians. Mark was killed by the heathens. I guess Aesop's moral of the story is, you can't beat them, join them. You have to beat down these people in succeeding incarnations by actually getting right alongside of them and moving with them until the power of your light is so intense that it transmutes their doctrine and their dogma either on the left or the right, the plus or the minus of the human spectrum. So on account of his miracles, for which they called him a magician, they resolved to put him to death. At last, on the pagan feast of the idol Serapis, the idol Serapis, there was a massive statue of Serapis there, of which we have, uh, I believe we have a, a picture. Some that were employed to discover the holy man found him offering to God the prayer of the oblation, or the mass. Overjoyed to find him in their power, they seized him, tied his feet with cords, and dragged him about the streets, crying out that the ox must be led to Bucolis, a place near the sea, full of rocks and precipices where probably oxen were fed. This happened on Sunday, the 24th of April, in the year of Christ, 68, and of Nero the 14th about three years after the death of Saints Peter and Paul. His masters went first, he went after them, and their mission was fulfilled. The saint was thus dragged the whole day, the whole day, staining the stones with his blood and leaving the ground strewed with pieces of his flesh. All the while he ceased not to praise and thank God for his sufferings. At night he was thrown into prison in which God comforted him by two visions. The next day the infidels dragged him as before till he happily expired on the 25th of April. The Christians gathered up the remains of his mangled body and buried them at Bucolis where they afterward usually assembled for prayer. I hope that when you remember the Lion of St. Mark and as you study his book and live your life, you will be able to thank God and praise him for sufferings less than these, that you will be bear, able to bear all things in the true spirit of Christ, as the saints and the martyrs have always done. You know how we complain because of this and that, some little inconvenience in our service, something that doesn't work right, car breaks down and people get inharmonious and they complain. We need to praise and thank God for his testings of our soul immediately, right then and there when they happen. It needs to be a habit, and it's a habit of Leo, the lion, God gratitude of the heart, gratefulness that we are tried and strengthened. God has to strengthen you. He cannot leave you in a state where everything is done for you, everything works out perfectly. You'll be flabby, you don't have any muscles, you don't have any drive of your mind to have to figure out solutions to life. God has to leave us in difficult situations so we can be strengthened. So when he wants to give us a mantle from Sirius or from Moria, that we have the inner strength to be the coordinate of it. The Great Litany is sung on the Feast of St. Mark. The origin of this custom is usually ascribed to St. Gregory the Great, who by a public supplication or litany with a procession of the whole city of Rome 
divided into seven bands or companies, obtained of God the extinction of a dreadful pestilence. The Greek word litany, which signifies supplication, is a public supplication to implore divine mercy. Kiri eleison, Lord, have mercy. Kiri eleison. Christe eleison, Christ, have mercy. These are repeated again and again in the litany. It remains customary to have a procession of this kind on St. Mark's Day, April 25th, known as the Greater Litanies. During this procession, litanies are recited to appease the wrath of God, particularly in consequence of certain calamities such as fire, flood, and earthquake. We are having a great deal of fire in Los Angeles. As you may have seen on the front page of the LA Times, whenever we get the Santa Ana winds and the dry spell, fires come along. During such a period, we fought our Camelot fire last year. And so, we know that in that fire is also the judgment of God. It has an effect on people of a purging. So it's a great occasion to give a litany. And we will give now the litany of the Blessed Virgin. There is a responsive reading, as in this litany we recite the titles of Mother Mary. And following my statement of the title, Holy Mary, you will respond, pray for us. In the name of the light of God that never fails, I call for the mighty causal body of our beloved Saint Mark, beloved Lanello. I call for the mantle of the saints. I call for the mantle of the gospel writer. I call for the lion of Saint Mark. I call for the action of the sacred fire and the understanding of Jehovah's servant. I call for the anointing of these souls of light as Jehovah's servant even he who is the forerunner of our beloved Sanat Kumara. I call for the mighty action of the sacred fire. I call for the great central sun magnet in the name of the Blessed Virgin, in the name of Jesus Christ and Saint Joseph, in the name of our own Christ self and I am presence. Let the healing light of Saint Mark descend upon this state, upon Los Angeles, upon this nation, upon this planetary body. Let there be the healing of those conditions of planetary karma causing burden to elemental life. I call forth the blessings and the grace of your mantle for the healing of elemental life that they might better bear the burden of the holding of the balance against oncoming cataclysm. I call for your full gathered momentum of the violet flame and the momentum of your devotion to our Lord in your service as Saint Mark. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ hear us. Christ graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Holy Mother of God, pray for us. Holy Virgin of Virgins, pray for us. Mother of Christ, pray for us. Mother of Divine Grace, Pray for us, Mother most pure, pray for us, Mother most chaste, pray for us, Mother inviolate, pray for us, Mother undefiled, pray for us, Mother most amiable, Mother most admirable, Mother of good counsel, Mother of our Creator, Mother of our Savior, Virgin most prudent, Virgin most venerable, Virgin most renowned, Virgin most powerful, Virgin most merciful, Virgin most faithful, Mirror of justice, Seat of wisdom, Cause of our joy, Spiritual vessel, Vessel of honor, Singular vessel of devotion, Mystical rose, Tower of David, Tower of ivory, House of gold, Ark of the Covenant, Gate of heaven, Morning star, Health of the sick, 
refuge of sinners, comforter of the afflicted, help of Christians, queen of angels, queen of patriarchs, queen of prophets, queen of apostles, queen of martyrs, queen of confessors, queen of virgins, queen of all saints, queen conceived without original sin, queen assumed into heaven, queen of the most holy rosary, queen of peace, Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Grant, we beseech thee, O Lord God, that we thy servants may enjoy lasting health of mind and body, and by the glorious intercession of the Blessed Mary, ever virgin, be delivered from present sorrow, and enter into the joy of eternal happiness, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Judgment has to do with the evaluation of the works of others. Righteousness has to do with the example of the way that we ought to walk in. So, to be the servant of Sanat Kumara, we must be the example of the right use of the law, righteous use of the law, and thereby be the instrument of the judgment of those who do not use it righteously. That is a prophecy and a description of Jesus Christ, Jeremiah 33, verse 15. Again, the reference to the branch and the description of what Christ incarnate is. Everywhere in the book of Mark, we find that the servant character of the incarnate Son is manifest. The key verse is Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. To minister, not to be ministered unto. The characteristic word is straightway, a servant's word. There is no genealogy in the book of Mark tracing back the ancestors of Jesus Christ. For who would give the genealogy of a servant? In other words, Mark does not consider it important what the human lineage and descent of Jesus Christ is. He is not trying to prove that he is Almighty God incarnate, and if he is trying to prove it, he has sense enough to know that you don't prove it by human genealogy in the first place. He establishes him as a servant. Therefore, you will notice the book of Mark, contrasting the book of Matthew, begins with the going before the face of Jesus, of John the Baptist, then the baptism of Jesus, and before you are through the first chapter of Mark, you are with Jesus in the wilderness, being tempted of the devil. So the work is right there. Being tempted of the devil is a mighty work. To overcome the works of the devil is the purpose for which he is come. Not only to work for God as his servant, but to undo the unrighteous works of the fallen ones. So Mark begins with a mission he leaves to others to account for his birth in Bethlehem and his early years. But this lowly servant, according to Mark, who emptied himself of the form of God and was found in fashion as a man, was nevertheless the mighty God. And Mark knew he was the mighty God, as he is prophesied in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Therefore, Mark opens chapter 1 of his Gospel with these words, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He positions him right there. And according to theology, even the theology of Origen, who followed with the interpretation of Mark, the Son of God is equal to God the Father. So he saw him as God, yet he understood his role as servant. Because he is the Son of God, Mark proves in his Gospel that mighty works accompanied and authentic authenticated the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ.
the understanding of Mark, of Christ as this servant of Jehovah, we find in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. That means he does not elevate himself as the God that he is. He does not proclaim himself. A bruised reed shall he not break. He will not break the bruised, but he will heal the bruised. He comes as the servant, not as the destroyer. You see the distinct role of destroyer in the person of Shiva, the Holy Spirit. It is an entirely different phase of the manifestation of the Trinity and of God. And the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. This is translated as the coasts but it might very well be seen as the British isles and as the descendants of Joseph that Ephraim and Manasseh will wait for the law of this Savior whom Isaiah is prophesying. The mark of the servant of God is that he is not discouraged. Discouragement can destroy your mission, destroy your life and your very soul. Aside from belittlement, the chief tool of the fallen ones is the projection of discouragement, that you're not getting anywhere, that you're not making any progress, and that what you are doing is really not amounting to anything anyway. It's not really helping anybody. It's not helping God or his kingdom. And of course, it is the denial of God where you are. So if you are really the servant's son and you know God is in you, discouragement does not even exist as a concept, a word, or a vibration. You do need to guard against it. This is the definition of you the servant. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. This is the definition of the servant of Jehovah. I have called you in the path of the right use of the law. I will hold your hand, you who are servant and would be servant. I will keep you. I will give you for a covenant of the people. In you will be found the light, the mediator between myself and my people. Through you, they will come to know me. Through you, the law will be fulfilled in them. For a light of the Gentiles, even a light to those who are not of the seed, and the descent of Abraham, or those tribes who have gone out in the way of the Gentiles. To open the blind eyes, I am giving you, my servant, to open the eyes of my people. Will you do it? Yes. yes. <laughs> Just wanted to see if you were with me here. <laughs> you. I will give you to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. In other words, I am not bestowing upon you the light of the only begotten. I am not endowing you with my God flame for your glory or even for my glory. I am sending you as the servant because I want certain things accomplished. I want works. I want you to do these things. There are conditions on earth that need the light. I am giving you that light not because you are a favorite son or because I in some way want to show that you are great and have greatness. I am giving you light because others need that light. 
We need to remember that when we bask in the light of the dictations and are absolutely suffused with the glow of the teaching, that we were not just plucked out from millions of people to sit there and enjoy the feast of God. We partake of the feast and we go out and we have work to do. There are prisoners in prison to their own bondage of human consciousness. I give you light to go and set them free. So there's a condition. It's like a, a loan from the cosmic bank. I am giving you a quantity of light, but there are things that I expect you to do with this light. You must return back to me with that light multiplied, having performed its service. So there is a contract, and the Christ in us is the very contract itself. So let us take heed when we are given so great a gift as the teachings of the Ascended Masters that we realize it is for a cosmic purpose. I am the Lord. That is my name. And here, L-O-R-D in cap. I am the I am who I am, Sanat Kumara. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth, ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Sing the new song of the, of the dynamic decree, you who with Christ, the servant, go down into the astral plane while he is crucified during the period of the Easter Passion. You who go down to the astral plane and all that is in that astral plane in the cities of the world, sing the new song, the science of the spoken word. The isles and the inhabitants thereof, let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Those who are the inhabitants of the rock are those in whom the threefold flame dwells. Let them sing. They are the ones you are going after. They must hear the word. They must understand this message. Let them shout from the top of the mountain of their I am presence. Let them make that attunement. Let their cry go forth. Let their call go forth. Let the earth be translated through you, through them. Let them give glory unto the Lord. I am that I am Sanat Kumara. And declare his praise in the islands. Repeat it again and again. The islands go after the descent of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. In other words, he's not going forth as a spirit. He's going in you. Christ in you is a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. Where you go, believe me, you stir up jealousy. You have too much light for those who have it not. They are envious. They will covet your possessions, everything you have. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. You will prevail against the enemies in your temple. You will prevail. It is prophesied. The I Am Presence has declared it. You will prevail in Christ against your enemies. Enter into this spiral and it is done. Enter into the free will surrender to your mission, and you will prevail over the enemies of the light. It is written. It is promised. Mark knew it. Jesus knew it. The gospel of deeds proclaims it. The whole gospel is about Jesus prevailing over his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills of karma and dry up all their herbs. And I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. And I will bring the blind by a way they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. 
I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them through you, the Lord's appointed servant. I will do all these things. Who are you wandering around to find out your divine plan and your mission? It's written in Isaiah. Read it. God says, I have remained silent. I have held my peace. That's the sealing of the white fire core of the atom of your I am presence. It remains sealed when the fervor of your love and devotion rises like a fire and heats that atom. And finally, God speaks. He delivers the whole fiery coil of your mission. Readiness, preparedness is the key. God will speak to you. Let your prayer be unto him, not crying out that he may speak to you, but crying out that you may be fully and thoroughly tried in the fire and ready on the day when he does speak. Because when God speaks, instantaneously action, instantaneously deeds, he will send you forth. Through you will be the karma that descends. This devouring, this making waste the mountains, drying up the herbs, making the rivers, drying up the pools, all of this is the reckoning that there will be an adjustment in the earth, even in the very physical earth, and we're experiencing that adjustment today. The descent of light demands the reckoning, the resolution, the balancing of karma. God will demand it of you. He will demand change before you can be the perfection of his servant. So you can expect when the light pours out, you will not be left in your former condition. Will you resist the change? and therefore thwart the whole spiral coming forth? Or will you know it's coming? Expect an earthquake in your life. Expect things to change. And expect to be called to the level of the Christ consciousness if you are to be a worthy servant. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images, in other people, in the outer self of anyone to be their savior that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. Don't be so foolish as to think that this is a prophecy about idol worshipers of stone. People were far more sophisticated. Isaiah knew what he was talking about. He was talking about the people of America who worship the Nephilim gods and their computers. Those are the idols. Those are the graven images, graven out of clay by Lucifer and the fallen ones, and Anu, Enki, and Enlil who made the mechanization man. It's a funny thing how people have been reading for centuries about idolatry and they're all worried about a little statue of Mother Mary and thinking that that is the height of idolatry. It's the worship of people. Americans are prone to this idolatry and they trust in the outer self, even of themselves. So here is the great warning. The servant of the Lord is coming. He may not be an idolater. You may not be an idolater if you are to receive him. Hear, ye deaf, and look, ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable." It's a very interesting passage about the blindness and the deafness of the messenger. The messenger will not see evil or human creation or your faults until the Lord reveal it. The Lord has given to the messenger to dwell in the immaculate heart of the cosmic virgin, holding such a powerful force field for you, for the magnet of your soul to be magnetized to your divine reality that the messenger appears deaf and blind. And people say, we can fool the messenger. The messenger will not know what we are doing. We can do thus and such behind the messenger's back. And then all of a sudden, after years and years of fooling the messenger, it all comes home and the individual receives the judgment in spite of the messenger, independent of the messenger, but through the messenger. I have to tell you a funny story. I went to San Francisco. I was greeted at the airport by some chilas, one 
a very, very dear chila, who said to me, as soon as he laid eyes on me, that when I had seen him a few years ago, he had asked for a healing, for a spot on his lungs. And he was there now meeting me at the airport to testify to the fact that he felt when I made the call and this entire substance dissolved in his lungs and he never had the spot on his lungs again. He said he felt the fire come in and burn up the spot. So now he had this problem and that problem and the next problem and therefore I should make an invocation for his healing. Now this was his request. This was his encounter with the guru. This was the uppermost thing on his mind. So I smiled. I was very happy to see him. I was ready to oblige. I told him that uh, I couldn't heal anyone, that God was the healer. And he said, yes, but God needs an interpreter. I said, fine, whatever God wishes to do, he will do. So we went on. These chilas were determined to take me out to dinner. I said, well, I don't want to go to a fish place. Take me to a Chinese restaurant. Go to San Francisco, you got to go to a Chinese restaurant. So found a Chinese restaurant, and I thought I would oblige because it was on the second floor, parked in the street. I would hop out of the car in case the car needed to drive on, and I'd go up and see if there was room and if we could get a reservation. So I hopped out of the car, slammed the door, went upstairs. In the meantime, this man had decided that he wasn't going to let me hop upstairs, that he was going to be the host and he was going to go up. So he was getting out of the car, and he grabbed onto the car door, and his various ailments made him a little bit slower than me. So he was holding on to the bar, and when I slammed the door, it closed on his hand. And he had two fingers in the door. Those who were in the car said he waited a full minute before he quietly said, Will someone please open the door? <laughs> so they opened the door, and when I came back, I found this calamity had happened through me though I was deaf and blind to the entire experience. I did not see his karma. I did not see what was required for him to be healed. I did not see his hand on the door, and I did not know the door slammed. I was in, a, in an attunement of bliss akin to samadhi at the time, a very high state of consciousness, and I was in absolute harmony. Nothing could have come through me except the will of God. Now remember, the chila asked, for the healing. And this is what he received. So we took him upstairs, found some ice, wrapped his hand in ice, put band-aids on. He had no damage to his hand except a little pain, which really was miraculous in itself. The car door was totally closed on these two fingers. <laughs> and uh, he was sitting there, and so I held his hand while we were waiting for the table to come, and I told him, well, if it weren't for the accident, I wouldn't have been holding his hand all this time. But all of a sudden, as he was meditating on the experience, he said, it just dawned on me. This karma have, has been 53 years coming home. He said, 53 years ago, I slammed a man's fingers in the door of a car. So it was not I who did this. It was the inexorable law of karma. The servant of Sanat Kumara is the instrument of the law though he be deaf and blind to all of the workings of the law. He is the, the transparency that God's work, God works through. God says that the servant will be his covenant to the people. You will be, for me, the walking law. Where you go, the law will be intensified. <clears throat> In addressing me for a healing, this chila was addressing God. He was addressing the point of fire that I bear. So came the response. So obviously some condition in his body was there because of a certain karma. And I hardly think that, that the only karma was slamming someone else's finger in a door. I think that uh, that little experience was a little chastening for probably a bundle of little different things here and there all come together where because he is a servant of God today, because he is diligent in his decrees, supports the movement, does all things religiously, he therefore may experience the balancing of a lot of karma with a token. You have to understand that God has 
a system of tokenism, whereby when you are in the rolling momentum of planetary service, they will come home to you a little portion. It's like a little part of the loaf, a little part of the dough, a little part of it. So you experience that karma ever so lightly, and you still have a test because you have to react to it. He has to react to the pain, react to the messenger. He could get very angry at me. You know, he could, he could have any reaction to me whatsoever, but he was perfectly sweet and peaceful about the whole thing, except chiding me that he was the one sh who should have run upstairs to make the appointment and not me, because uh, he was my host. But other than that, he was very gracious, and in that he was also gracious. Now, people who have observed the messenger over the years know that this goes on all, of, all the time. I haven't the faintest idea of how God is using me as servant. I will come upon a situation, I will say something, I will have no idea that it is offensive to anyone, and first thing you know, somebody is absolutely into a tizzy over something and uh, finding out, and I'm finding out that it's a, it's a big confrontation and it's a big test. Also, there is that concept of, of the blindness of the messenger as not being aware of, of the things that children do, etc., and get away with behind my back. So that is the way God operates. He lets you be a vessel. He doesn't tell you everything. He goes on a need-to-know basis. What you need to know, he tells you. And usually what you need to know is where to be at the right time, at the right place. And that's why Moria says we should, we should take care to be on time. So if you're at the right time, in the right place, you'll inevitably be the instrument of God. Inevitably. That's just the way it goes. If you dedicate yourself to this path. And I don't know if I could have understood this had I not seen it outpictured in the life of Mark and be in such a state of wonder as how it works through me and how I'm continually amazed that God does all of these things and there is such a oneness with God and there's such a trust. This is what you have to realize, that God trusts you so much when you are his servant that it's like this very intimate understanding of father and son. He doesn't have to bother to inform you that you're going to do this at such and such a time or you're going to do that. It's understood. You're already committed to the job. You'll go where you're supposed to do. You'll go where you're supposed to be. You'll do what you're supposed to do. And therefore, there doesn't have to be a lot of words. It's a mutual understanding, a mutual interdependence. It is a wonderful way to live. I commend you to living in this way. It's exciting. And the more you test yourself on the lesson of obedience, the more you are learning to identify the voice of God, to obey His voice, to silence the babble of all the other voices that are competing for you. And they're often the loudest ones, but God's voice will be the still and strong voice. It may be small, but it's very strong, very definite. It has a very personal vibration. Your mighty I Am Presence has an unmistakable vibration. You must know its vibration. You must know the vibration of your Christ Self. And then a thousand other voices will not be able to lead you astray with enticement. God doesn't entice you. He doesn't make promises of all the wonderful things that are going to happen to you if you obey him. He simply says, go, do, be, act, will, pray, decree, commands. You go do it, and it's your joy of discovery to find out what he will do for you when you obey him. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law through you, and through you he will make his law honorable. You should know, as Schofield has taught in the opening introduction to the gospel, that the book is in five principal divisions. The first division is the manifestation of the servant's son, the coming of Jesus. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. The second is the servant's son tested as to his fidelity. And that's chapter 1, 12 and 13. The third is the, th the servant's son at work. Chapter 1, 
verse 14, to chapter 13, verse 37, the servant's son at work. The third section occupies 12 chapters. The fourth section, the servant's son, obedient unto death, chapter 14, verses 1 through chapter 15, verse 47. The fifth division, the ministry of the risen servant son, now exalted to all authority. Because he has been the servant son and is risen, he has the full authority of God. And that concludes and is chapter 16, verses 1 to 20. It is stated that the events recorded in the book cover a period of seven years. Now concerning the commentary by the Church Fathers on the Book of Mark, the earliest statement about the Gospel that is in existence concerning Mark comes from Papias around 140 A.D. He wrote, Mark, who became Peter's interpreter, wrote accurately, though not in order, all that he remembered of the things said and done by the Lord. For he had neither heard the Lord nor been one of his followers, but afterward, as I said, he had followed Peter, who used to compose his discourses with a view to the needs of his hearers, but not as if he were composing a systematic account of the Lord's sayings. So Mark did nothing blameworthy in thus writing some things, just as he remembered them, for he was careful of this one thing, to omit none of the things he had heard, and to state no untruth therein. The Gospel itself in, is anonymous, but it contains nothing which forbids us to accept the universal tradition that its author was Mark, the associate of Peter. That the Gospel was written after the death of Peter is explicitly stated by Irenaeus and is borne out by the internal evidence. We may date the Gospel then between A.D. 65 and 70. Approximately 30 to 40 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ. That is not so long. And of course, we do not know that Mark did not take copious notes at the time. So he may not have written from memory. He may have written from the very notes he took when Peter spoke. Nevertheless, the impact of such an event in history was bound to leave an indelible memory in those who wrote. Also, since most things were carried by memory, people's memories were sharper in those days. The striking frankness with which details to the discredit of Peter are related is best accounted for on the assumption that he had already died a martyr's death so that the unsparing recital of his past failures would not offend the church for which the gospel was written, but would rather be welcomed as an encouragement to weak Christians. Peter's evangelist makes no mention of the high commendations which Christ gave that apostle on his making that explicit confession of his being the Son of God. Neither does he mention his walking on the water, but gives at full length the history of St. Peter's denying his master with all its circumstances. The interesting thing about portraying Peter's weaknesses as an encouragement to weak Christians is that those who would be weak take advantage of the situation. Well, Peter failed, so if I fail, I'll still get into the kingdom of heaven. And the whole story is not known, of course, that Peter has not yet gotten into the kingdom of heaven. He never has ascended yet, and he has reincarnated through this century. So his failures definitely were a karmic condition. And one of the great failures, as you have heard, is the transmittal of his idolatrous consciousness to the whole fabric and warp and woof of the church itself, which is why we are outside of the church today, because of its flesh and blood consciousness. The gospel, according to St. Mark, was for many centuries thought to be merely an abridgment of Matthew, and so tended to be the least valued and least read. It is now widely recognized as the earliest of the synoptic gospels. The arguments upon which this conclusion is based include the fact that the substance of over 90% of Mark's verses is contained in Matthew, 
the substance of over 50% in Luke. Where the same matter is contained in all three synoptic gospels, usually more than half Mark's actual words are to be found either in both Matthew and Luke or in one of them. The order in which the material is arranged in Mark is usually followed by both Matthew and Luke. Often where Matthew or Luke differ with Mark in language, the language of the other evangelists is either grammatically or stylistically smoother and more correct than that of Mark. On other occasions, something in Mark which could perplex or offend is either absent from or appears in a less sharp form in Matthew or Luke. The statement that Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled, Mark 14.33, is softer in Matthew 26.37 and omitted altogether in Luke. The picture of the three disciples' failure to watch with Jesus in Gethsemane is considerably softened by the addition of the words for sorrow, Luke 22.45. In Mark 14.71, Peter is said to have begun to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man. But Luke has the much less offensive saying, man, I do not know what you are saying. Now, when I came early into this activity, I met the reincarnation of Luke, who was a, physi a physician uh, at the time that he was also the gospel writer. I observed this man. I saw him as a student of the Ascended Masters. And I saw that one of his great goals in life was to write down a synthesis of the Master's teachings. And he was one of the first people to answer many of my questions about the Ascended Masters before I was taken as a disciple of El Moria. What I began to notice about this man is that for the sake of a nice story or nice words, he would compromise the truth. And for the sake of having something to say, he went to psychic channels and mediators, excuse me, mediums, to fill in where the Ascended Masters may not have spoken on a certain subject. Now, El Moria had me watch this man for years. And although he himself claimed that he was Luke, the writer of the Gospel, I didn't give much credence to that until years later when El Moria himself told me that that was true. Still later, El Moria showed me how the book of Luke itself contains the embellishments the embroiderings and the fabrications of Luke. Now Luke was not only the author of the book of Luke, but he was the author of the book of Acts. And the book of the Acts is the only continuous historical account we have of the Acts of the Apostles, what they did, where they went, and what they said. The book of Acts has the account of Jesus' ascension in its fullest mode. It also has the descent on Pentecost of the Holy Spirit. And it talks about people speaking in tongues. There is a very literal interpretation of Luke. Luke is the one who sets forth very definitely the virgin birth, where the virgin birth is not even mentioned by Mark. Wouldn't you think something as important as the virgin birth, if it were authentic, would have been taught by Peter and written down by Mark? But it's not here. It's in the book of Luke. Luke also has the account about um, the two uh, thieves on the cross and Jesus making the comment to those who are thieves crucified with him, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Other gospels don't say that they said that and it is disputed in the theology of the church as to whether that ever happened. So when you realize that I am not denying the virgin birth, but I'm pointing to the fact that God has ordained, and God did ordain Saint Germain as Joseph to be the father and guru of Jesus. That in the order of things as God has ordained it unto man and to woman as sons and daughters of God, there is no apparent reason as to why the sons and daughters that God has made in his image and likeness should not be fitting servants to bring forth and to conceive by the Holy Ghost the Son of God. So the angel of the Lord tells Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and overshadow thee, and thou shalt conceive and bring forth a son. 
Well, when we understand in the tradition of our teaching that the manifestation of God always has a representative, if the Holy Ghost is going to come upon Mary, we may consider that in the context that there is always the incarnate representative, that the representative and truly the one through whom the Holy Ghost came to Mary was none other than St. Joseph himself becomes quite apparent. Now it was supposed by all at the time of Jesus' birth that Joseph was his father. It was commonly accepted. Now it is, let us say, my contention that I lay upon the altar of your heart and the altar of God, God not wishing to thin this veil any, any further. It is my contention that the doctrine of the virgin birth is the invention of the fallen ones to make absolutely unworthy every father, every husband, every son on the planet. The highest and most holy mission of man is the bearer of the seed of Sanat Kumara. Sanat Kumara promises this seed to Abraham. Literally within his genes and chromosomes, he has the fabric and the ability to transmit the light of Christ. Literally, that is the gift. Sarah conceived Isaac by Abraham. And all of the descendants leading to the incarnation of Jesus Christ were the descendants of that seed. So the transmittal of the seed of the Christ light as the threefold flame and as a very special essence within us is spiritual as well as physical. Ultimately, it is spiritual as we are found in various evolutions and life waves on the planetary body. The seed of Christ, which is the threefold flame, ultimately is a spiritual flame. But it also is a certain descent and lineage, and has been. So when you realize this, you begin to, to say to yourself, if it is the goal of all of us to become the Son of God, but you can't become the Son of God unless you are conceived by a virgin physically, then where does that leave us? That leaves us as miserable sinner, sinners, unable to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. We must only be saved by his sacrifice, not by our own works. Mark's gospel is the gospel of works. Jesus Christ's teaching to us is that we must go and do the same works that he did. Well, how can we do those works if the doctrine of the virgin birth is true, making everybody else incapable of those works because they were not conceived by this virgin birth? Do you see? So by the very process of understanding the path, you would have to come to the realization, the logical conclusion of the Logos, that if the mission of Jesus Christ is true, if all that he came to do, which was to announce to us the true meaning of our seed of, of Sanat Kumara, then there would have been no need for a virgin birth. In fact, the virgin birth becomes alien to the entire remaining logic of the entire teaching. It's the one thing that's out of logic with all the rest that we have been taught because of its ramifications. Now, who wants us to have these ramifications? Why the fallen ones? The Nephilim. The Nephilim gods want us to believe that we are inferior and incapable of the mission that is given to us. So where do they deny it? At the very root, at the very nadir, at the very seed of our being, we supposedly are conceived in original sin, and because of that, Nothing else is going to work for us in our lives forevermore. The only hope of salvation is because one Son of God came down. So you see the diabolical lie, and as I've said before, what happens to man? He doesn't have any self-esteem. What's he good for? The highest and holiest purpose to which he is born, which is for the conception of the Christ child, whether by his wife, bringing forth a physical child, or whether the conception of civilizations and inventions and business and projects and plans and all of these things. If man cannot do this, then he starts considering he's not worthy of the Divine Mother. He's not worthy to marry the Divine Mother. He's not worthy to bear her son. So he goes whoring after the great whore. He goes with the serpents, the serpent women, who are the Nephilim offspring. And it's a complete breakdown of the family because of this absence of vision as to what man has to live for. So having seen this, 
And I think that El Moria felt it was the most important of my experiences. This happened in Boston. The leader of that group was none other than Luke that I found in that building. And so it was. He was doing a work for the masters, but he, sta he still had his inherent weaknesses. Now, ultimately, he rejected Mark and went his way to become a synthesizer of the teachings and to write his own book and to have his own activity. Yet he had abundant proof of the miracles of God through Mark Prophet and knew he was a messenger. Why was he at odds with him? It's very simple if you just compare the two Gospels. Mark is forthright, truthful, authentic, leaves out nothing, tells it like it is, is unashamed, is non-attached to human creation, wants us to see it for what it is, wherever it is. Luke wants to, to write a pretty story. He wants to paint a pretty picture. He wants things all to look right. He wants everything to line up together. You find as you go through the book of Acts that much of the doctrine and much of the descriptions are also embroidered, all leading to a flesh and blood consciousness of Jesus who is holy because in the flesh and in the blood he's conceived by a virgin, a physical virgin. It's all the idolatrous sense that because of the condition of the flesh, we are perfect or we are God. They made him a flesh and blood God by conditioning his godhood on the fact that his mother was a virgin and, and also conceived immaculately by her parents. You see this funny business? What good is it for us to justify the flesh? We are not justified by the flesh. We are justified because the Spirit of the Lord comes unto us and ignites in us the threefold flame. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter where you came from. You could even have somebody three generations back be, be a Nephilim that intermarried with somebody in your descent. It doesn't matter what your body's made of. Your body's made of God's stuff. And he chose to put a flame in your temple, and that's why you can inherit godhood. And that's why there's hope for people of any descent. The state of hopelessness is not to have a threefold flame. You could have a perfectly beautiful body, graven images, carved out by genetic engineering, perfect idol. You could be the most magnificent person on earth and be in a hopeless state. This idolatry, this seed of Lucifer, of the denial of the worth of Saint Joseph, is the thing that has all but destroyed Christianity in what it should have been its true form. Jesus Christ, our elder brother, who rises to the position of avatar and tells us, you can do likewise. If I didn't know this, I could have such a condemnation of the church upon me today that I could think that I was such a miserable sinner that I couldn't possibly be the Word incarnate. The Word where I am and my understanding of that Word has swallowed up sin and the sense of sin and the sense of humanness because God knows that people do condemn me for what I've done and haven't done, what they think they've done, etc., etc., what they think I've done. And it will happen of you. And if you don't have the strength to realize that you are justified by Christ, the incarnate word, the Emmanuel, you fall under this condemnation. People commit suicide over continuous newspaper press reports. They can't take it that the whole world thinks they're terrible because they thought they were great because of their flesh and blood. So when the paper comes out and paints them as being evil in their flesh and blood, they collapse. Terrible things happen to people when they are persecuted and condemned. And the people who write the newspaper articles know this, and their intent is to destroy. By psychic murder, by mental cruelty, you galvanize millions of people to think somebody is evil, somebody is a cult leader, somebody is brainwashing everybody. And you have to stand with that year in, year out, day in, through the night, through the day. You have to stand with that condemnation. What can stand against it? Your flesh and blood? Don't kid yourself. Your noble birth, nothing is going to stand. Your wealth, nothing can stand against that. But the fact that you are integrated with God where you are, and Christ is there, and there's such a fire burning in your heart, it just keeps on swallowing it up. It keeps, the, the fire literally is like tongues 
tongues of fire keep on lapping up the words of your enemies and the words of condemnation. And God will not give you that kind of persecution to deal with until you have internalized enough light. He will put the light in you first, and then he'll let you start experiencing it, a little by little. A little bit of gossip here, a little bit of condemnation there. Your best friend says something terrible behind your back, and you think you're going to collapse in a heap because this terrible thing happened. And then pretty soon you find out that your real peace and joy is in your heart. It's in, in the peace of the flame within. So you overcome it on a one-to-one -one basis, and you keep on getting stronger and stronger, and, and even when you hear about it, you just keep on praising God. You don't even lose a step. So then God sees you're strong enough, and he, he lets you get better known, and he lets the thing go on. So there you are. It's a, it's a very great mystery to study the New Testament. You have to study the Apocrypha, and you have to study the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are all kinds of things in the unpublished books of the New Testament that will shed light on the Bible. You have to read with discrimination because there are some views and statements in the Dead Sea Scrolls that I think, I, th I myself think, are slightly off in the commentators of the time. So everything with a grain of salt, everything with understanding. But unfortunately, orthodoxy begins with these Gospels, the orthodoxy of the flesh and blood Jesus. And I tell you something, these fallen ones have taken Jesus, they've put him in a, in a glass coffin for a display to all the world, they have carefully sealed him in this glass sarcophagus, and they have deprived all other peoples of his message because there is something so wrong at the same, that there is, at the same time there's, that there's something so right about the message. There's something so wrong about the idolatry, idolatry of Jesus today that Jews will not accept it, Hindus don't accept it, Buddhists don't accept the Christian message as it's taught, and they ought to because the very teaching is in their own teachings. The concept of the avatara and the word incarnate is Hindu at its foundation. It's all the way back in the ancient texts. It's the order of life on earth, the incarnation of the word. But what they're not about to accept is that Jesus is the only Son of God. Jesus is the world Savior who, by the misinterpretation of the fallen ones, is rejected. It's like Gandhi, the great Hindu. He loved Jesus, but he didn't like Christianity. A great devotee of Jesus. So you have this worldwide schism and the, unavailab the unavailability of the person of Jesus to everyone. It's for an exclusive group of people who have swallowed the whole cloth of this misinterpretation. And they call themselves Christians not realizing that they have been brainwashed. So there's a cult of Christianity today. And then there's the original Christianity. And of course, you know who calls who what. <laughs> but you have to know who and what you are and decide for yourself. Mark then was strikingly frank very interesting because he re-embodied as the first of the Frankish kings, Clovis, and was very frank when his wife said uh, that he should be converted to, to Christ. And he said, well, I will be if I win the battle. So he won the battle, was converted to Christ, and therefore France became Catholic. So he was always frank, and that's the most important quality that you can be. And you know something? When you meet a frank person, and if you have a, a friend that is frank, you realize that there are modes of thinking and speaking that are constantly devious in people. We try to couch things and say things in phrases so as not to offend someone, to not quite hammer the nail right on the head with a hammer of Mark. And there's a lot of conversation that goes on to try and mitigate and arrange and appease and compromise. And all of a sudden, somebody, Frank, walks in and says three sentences. Everybody knows what to do, where to go, and where everything lays. So you, you need to watch the machinations of your own mind with an absence of honesty, frankness, forthrightness, and boldness. When you are that way, you'll have the greatest friends in the world championing you. You may have few friends, 
but you'll have the finest people that you could ever meet anywhere, loyal to you, to your dying breath, because they know they'll always get an honest answer from you. In Mark, listen to this, the disciples' pre-resurrection mode of addressing Jesus as teacher and rabbi is faithfully reflected. They called him teacher, just like we would call Mark our guru. They called him teacher, rabbi. Whereas Matthew and Luke often represent him as addressed by the title Lord, thus reflecting the post-resurrection usage of the church. So what they did is they injected into the story when they wrote their books 60 years later or 40 years later, they injected the deification of Jesus before he himself even allowed anyone to know that he was the Christ, or before he himself, he himself felt that he was perfected. Jesus did not feel he was perfected until he was resurrected and after his resurrection. If Mark then is the earliest of the Gospels, its special importance as our primary source of information about the ministry of Jesus is obvious. Now the place where you can go and examine these accounts is in this wonderful book called A Harmony of the Gospels. A Harmony of the Gospels. It belongs on your shelf with your King James Version with commentary by Schofield, your Cruden's Concordance, and your dictionary. The harmony of the Gospels begins at the beginning and has four parallel columns on each page. So side by side you see each of the four Gospel writers what they wrote. Now where only one Gospel writer wrote anything, like part first, the period of preparation, begins with John 1, 1 Nobody else wrote, in the beginning was the word. He's the only one who wrote it, so he gets the full page. You go on, and it's uh, Luke and Luke, because they're the only one, he's the only one that wrote. Then you get to the place of the genealogies of Jesus, and you see Mark wrote nothing, Matthew wrote something, Luke wrote something, John wrote nothing, and so it goes. So as it goes along, you can look at any account or any parable or any healing. You can see the slight changes of the words, the slight differences in the story, and you can clearly see every time you look, I have all these places marked, where Mark speaks, he's more blunt, perhaps less smooth in his language, and he includes facts that are nowhere else, often those that are embarrassing and too strong, which are omitted. So this is the way to be a sleuth and to really study. Here are four different individuals, different entirely, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all have a different way of telling the same story. Then you start understanding their character, and you find out that John has the mystical understanding of the love of Jesus Christ that no other disciple had because he was the closest. You find that Mark has a mystical understanding of going straight to the heart of the whole purpose of Jesus. You find that Matthew and Luke are the storytellers, are the embroiderers. They want to create a nice little storybook. You find that those who go into the deep ministry of Jesus will read John. And when you correctly understand the love that is portrayed, and it is not a human love, you go right from John the Beloved to the path of the saints of the church, to St. John of the Cross, to the marriage of the soul, to the bridegroom. While on earth the soul of John was wed to the Christ in Jesus, it was the Guru Chila relationship. And John, of course, ascended. So Mark is really the source book for Luke and Matthew, to which they added whatever other source materials they found or whatever else they heard. There are narratives which by their vividness and wealth of detail give the impression of being derived directly from the reminiscence of an eyewitness. Some of these are narratives in which Peter figures prominently or which must have been a special interest for him. Others relate incidents at which only a few, but including Peter, were present. The latter half of Mark's Gospel is dominated by the Passion. That's chapters 8 to 10. In the former half of the Gospel, there are many features which point forward to it. The reference to the arrest of John the Baptist, the forerunner, the crescendo of opposition, culminating in the plot against Jesus' life, the scribe's accusation, 
the rejection at Nazareth, and the account of Herod's fears, followed by the story of John's martyrdom. The movement of the gospel is the march of Jesus toward the cross and the resurrection. Mark's emphasis on the passion is an indication of his purpose to set forth the good news of the deed of God for the world's salvation. It is not, however, intended to suggest that what preceded the actual passion was unimportant. But these things are rightly understood only when they are seen in the light of what followed them. The Gospel of St. Mark was written from faith to faith. Its purpose was not simply to pass on some historical information, but to support faith. Its contents are not the coldly objective depositions of neutral observers, but the testimony of people who believed in Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God. While some of the material in the Gospel probably derives from the reminiscence of Peter, much of it bears the marks of having undergone the processes of oral tradition, being told again and again. Where Mark did not find vivid details in the material which he had received, he refrained from creating them. This is one explanation as to why the book is short. If he didn't have anything to say, he didn't say it, and he didn't embroider. That leaves our Christ discrimination to interpret those events. You can't interpret an event when it's not told you properly. You have to know exactly what happened, then you sit down and figure out what is the import of it. So he has a certain respect for each one's integrity of having a right to know the event without somebody else's projecting into it things that weren't there. As I mentioned, I think, uh, Mark does not have Peter walking on the water. I believe that's Luke. And yet it was Peter whose book he wrote down. Now, wouldn't you think Peter would have him write down the story of him walking on the water? But he didn't. Now, why, we don't know. I'm not prepared to, to say that that's not a true story. But for reasons unknown to us, it didn't get in. The evidence does not point to Marx having been a born storyteller, the sort of person who just cannot tell a story badly, as has sometimes been suggested. Rather, it suggests that the vividness characteristic of so much of the gospel must be attributed not to Mark, but to his sources. Mark's peculiar merit as an evangelist would seem to have been that of self-restraint, the virtue of a witness. Self-restraint. Restraining oneself from reading into a situation what is simply not there. It reflects a real reverence for the sacredness of historical events, which Mark believed to have been the very deed of God. God showed Mark, and Mark believed that every work that he observed, even among the apostles, was the deed of God, that God was acting through the whole drama. And since it was the deed of God, he dare not embellish it. When he has received a unit of tradition in isolation and has no reliable information about its historical context, Mark does not supply from his imagination suitable temporal and geographical details to link it with the context in which he sets it, but prefers to introduce it with a simple and. By contrast, Matthew and Luke sometimes introduce connecting links where Mark has none. For example, Luke connects the question about fasting with a supper in Levi's house. Matthew connects Jesus' withdrawal with the execution of the Baptist by the phrase, now when Jesus heard this. The same restraint is apparent in the way Mark leaves intact groups of units which he has received as such, even when the grouping is clearly topical and not historical. The conclusion to be drawn from this evidence is surely that we may have very great confidence in Mark's own reliability. I can testify to you the reliability of Mark as a messenger in this embodiment. He would not say anything that he was not totally convinced of. If Moria said ten words, he would not add in an eleventh word to either soften or somehow modify what Moria said. You have to realize that this modification process occurs even before the reasoning process. 
I see this happen all the time. I give someone a message to go give someone else. By the time they've told it to one person, it's entirely different than what I said. I give specific words, a specific sentence, and I hear someone call someone up on the phone, and they give an interpretation of what I said. I said, I don't need an interpretation. I want the person to hear these words, because I know that I've already spoken with that person. I know what they're waiting to hear from me as a message. They will understand these words. So it's something that's inherent in the, in the mental body, the carnal mind. It's a terrible habit, but it happens to all of us. You hear something, and you don't repeat it as you hear it. You receive an order to do something, you do it a different way. That shows that before you get to the point of action, something has happened in the hopper of this computer. And you have to be very pure. This quality of purity is rare. It's a virtue of virtues to be able to be a pure stream and a clear reflector and not interject your opinion. The history Mark records is the history of the hidden Lord. This is very interesting. The Lord, who having laid aside every outwardly compelling evidence of his divine glory, had become one whose claim to authority could only appear to the world paradoxical and problematic. The hiddenness was an essential part of the cost of redeeming the many. For while his presence placed men in a situation of crisis, the hiddenness was necessary in order that they might be allowed sufficient room in which to make a personal decision. Everything in the ministry of Jesus has to be seen in the light of this hiddenness of the Divine Lord. Here is the clue to the understanding of his refusal to give a sign, his silencing of the demoniacs who were crying out that he was Christ his efforts to limit the publicity of his miracles, his teaching the multitudes by means of parables. He didn't go out to the multitudes on many occasions and actually exhibit great feats. He taught them in parables because he wanted them to follow a teaching and work works. And he confined his more direct teaching about himself and the kingdom of God to his disciples, his enjoining secrecy on the disciples and also the slowness of the disciples to understand, which he himself controlled. He didn't want them to understand so quickly that he was God incarnate. Why? The hiddenness is necessary. A person has to decide whether or not he's going to follow his I Am Presence, his Christ Self, and they are hidden. An ascended master, he is hidden. It gives them that room of free will, whereas if an ascended master is standing right in front of you in all of his blazing glory, what do you do? Well, you feel absolutely compelled to have a conversion on the spot. But you haven't gone through this conversion by a process of the internalization of the word itself. So there isn't any real conversion in that manner. It's not lasting. So the hiddenness of Jesus as the Christ was a part of his ministry. Go and tell no man. He asked the disciples, who, who do you think I am at certain points? He wanted to see if they were arriving at the correct conclusion. Because if they didn't arrive at the correct conclusion, they would never understand that the purpose of his mission was to be the incarnate word so that every other disciple could become the incarnate word. And he knew that the masses would make him a god. And the last thing he ever wanted to be was a god. But he was made a god, and he's been made a god and, and remains that god ever since. See, you don't have to imitate a god. That's the whole problem with the Catholic Church today. You go worship him, but you don't have to be like him. You can imitate a few of his ways. The more mystical you are, the more saintly you're inclined, you start imitating. But basically, people are sinners, Jesus is God, and through some great process, they get to heaven. And it's just not the truth. So Jesus wanted to hide that he was God from those who would worship him and reveal it to those who would imitate him. And John the Baptist was the same. He didn't admit he was Elias, come again. Mark understood this. Mark did not try to make him be deified where Jesus himself 
was not claiming deification. He kept it historical as it was. Now you see, if, if people are so foolish as to go around proclaiming the messenger as the deliverer or the messenger today, myself, as the word incarnate, instead of proclaiming each one's I am presence and Christ self as the deliverer, what you will accomplish is to turn people off to the teachings because people are too smart. Nobody wants to go and, and visit some god or some deity prancing around on earth. People are too smart for that today. So if you have an idolatrous sense of me and you've missed the whole point that the whole teaching centers around you and your Christ potential, you're going to go out and say things that only serve to hasten the crucifixion of the messenger and to hasten the downfall of those who cannot possibly follow a god in someone else whom they have not internalized in themselves. Jesus founded his church upon the rock of Peter because Peter's confession of him as Christ, the rock, was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He said, flesh and blood hath not revealed it, un revealed it unto you, but God has revealed this to you. Because God reveals to you the light that may be in me, it means the light in you is bearing witness not the idolater, not the carnal mind, not your mental body who sees a few miracles and a few feats, feats like Philip and, and uh, decides that uh, that is the basis of the Son of God. So the only one who can confess that Jesus is Lord or is the I am that I am is the one who has the Holy Spirit. And that confession should be an intimate personal communion within yourself and God. There is no point in all the world, whether I am or whether I'm not the Word incarnate, there is no point for anybody to think it, to know it, or to believe it unless they first discovered the Word in themselves. It's an irrelevant message, do you understand? Totally irrelevant. The relevancy of God where I am is that it's an office and a focal point so that the Great White Brotherhood can do their mission keep the community together, give the initiations, be the instrument of judgment, etc. But it is not relevant to the person who enters the path and is going to start reciting the violet flame and start approaching his own, his own Christ self. It is threatening. It's a totally threatening idea. And it will cause people to be idolaters. Why bother making a statement like that when you come down to it? Why not talk about the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world? Why not talk about your own Christ self or the person's Christ self? The messenger is servant. Leave me there. Leave me be the Lord's servant. That's where I'm happy. If God is where I am, I didn't do it anyway. So why give credit to a person with a name and a body? I mean, if God is God where I am, then talk about God. Leave out, leave out the wrappings. Leave out the trimmings. It's, it's unessential. Jesus liked to be our friend. That's why he came to Bethany. He came to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus because we did not treat him as a god. We treated him as a friend. You know, the famous statement of Martha you know, Jesus, you know, she's sitting and, and uh, listening to you and I have to do all the work. Can you imagine saying that to a God? Martha said that to a brother and a friend. It would be disrespectful to say that to God, right? And Jesus came back to her as a friend too and he chided her as a chila. It's a good thing. It's a real good thing. Now I let everybody else do the work, huh? Now, it's, it's very important that you make God feel at home. Who's God? The person next to you. Relate to people as people. Relate to people as friends. Relate to them as, as God, but not as the Nephilim gods. Mark understood it. Mark lived it. He left everybody else to figure out who and what he was.
When Sanat Kumara has proclaimed his word through me and has declared his manifestation, he has done it for disciples. We have a much wider body of disciples today than Jesus had. And finally, in the end, it came out publicly that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was the Son of the Father. So when it is finally stated, as these dictations get passed around, it is stated for another reason entirely, that the fallen ones, having now found who is the latest avatar or who is the latest Son of God, may rise up and destroy that one and thereby be judged. That's an entirely different purpose to proclaiming the Christ incarnate because that is what they fall over. And they'll fall over it when you proclaim it of yourself, as you should, and when you are it. I am the Son of God. The secret of the kingdom of God which had been revealed to the disciples was the secret of its presence in Jesus Christ. That's the great secret of the kingdom of God and that it's within you also. One of Mark's major concepts is that throughout his ministry, Jesus wished to keep his messiahship a secret until the very end. This idea is not found in any other gospel. In Matthew and Luke, Jesus is known to be the Messiah from his birth. These writers copy Mark's passages about the messianic secret, but they continually violate Mark's meaning. The Messiah incognito meant nothing to them completely passed them by. It was too subtle. The Messiah, evidently it was not an established part of Christian tradition either. We may regard it as Mark's own literary invention. Or we may regard it as his direct contact with the living word. The most striking feature of Mark's plot is the revelation of Jesus' Messiahship to widening groups of people at appropriate times, to Peter, to the disciples, to the Jewish nation, and to the Gentiles. There is nothing in the individual stories of which Mark's gospel is composed to suggest such a plan. If we assume, as most scholars do, that these tales once circulated as isolated traditions, then there is nothing in the unrelated fragments which would indicate that the early Christians held any such notion. It is only when we see them put together in the order in Mark's Gospel that the pattern of God's progressive disclosure of Jesus' Messiahship becomes evident. The Gospel of Mark is written from the point of view of faith in the living and exalted Lord. The very fact of his having put pen to paper to write an altogether new and special sort of book which was not a mere memoir or biography or history, but a gospel, points to such a faith. We must make due allowance for the fact that much of Mark's material seems to have come to him as isolated units, carrying no indications of their proper historical contexts, while some was already grouped, not historically, but topically. The style of the gospel is unpretentious and close to the everyday speech of the time. While it lacks the refinements of literary Greek it has the merits of simplicity and directness. The Semitic flavor is unmistakable, but the Greek of the Gospel, though it reflects strongly the influence of Aramaic, and though it is certainly rough and colloquial, is not incompetent. Mark's style is simple and direct, and at the same time free, unconstrained, forcible, and full of life. The word which best describes his style is Conversational. <laughs> Just like all his lectures today, they're conversational. The evangelist evidently takes delight in reproducing what he knows, and simple as his language is, it is that of a writer, one might almost say of a talker, to whom narrating is a pleasure. <laughs> Mark's gospel was written in the spirit and manner of a preacher rather than an historian much less a biographer. He does not merely chronicle each incident, but surrounds them with all the circumstances that made them impressive to the bystanders and constrains us to feel how deep that impression was. He depicts the wonder and awe with which Christ's words were listened to 
and his mighty deeds witnessed. A special aspect of the Markan realism is what Professor Burkitt calls its unecclesiastical unconventionality. The candor shown in dealing with the shortcomings and failures of the apostles, in spite of the reverence for them, felt during the apostolic age. Realism characterizes the Markan picture of Jesus, particularly his strong emotions both of anger and pity. Jesus had strong emotions, strong feelings about what he was involved with. Mark did not feel called on or free to suppress what came to him through good tradition. Mark is careful to record minute particulars of person, number, time, and place, which are unnoticed by the other evangelists. The gospel, according to Mark, is the simplest and the most objective. It notices how Jesus acted, looked, and comported himself. Mark's design is to present our Lord to us as the incarnate and wonder-working Son of God, living and acting among men, to portray him in the fullness of his living energy. Mark's gospel shows Jesus suffering and victorious as God's anointed, and it shows that he expected his followers to suffer and to be victorious also. The majority of critics today view Mark's gospel as a loosely compiled collection of separate incidents and sayings taken from early Christian tradition and put together with very little order or cohesion. A few scholars, however, feel that there is far more in Mark's work than meets the casual eye, and that rather than being thrown together with hasty simplicity, it is actually arranged according to a carefully laid imaginative plan, perhaps how God the Father himself would have told the story. One scholar has even gone so far as to say that he sees the evidence of Mark's creative genius on every page. A growing number of scholars are coming to feel that we should no longer think of Mark as a mere compiler, but we should recognize his gospel as a work of genuine dramatic and literary art. Incident follows incident not because they happened in that order or because they chanced so to float together, but because the author has purposefully arranged them that way in keeping with his calculated plan. In other words, the book is spherical. Just the way pearls of wisdom are, they are there because it's a spiral that takes you into the heart of Christ by an unconventional line method, a biographical line of historical dates unfolding and so forth. As an original creative work intended to express a theological viewpoint, Mark is far more like John's gospel than has been believed. Rather than being a loosely put together collection of ancient traditions, it is composed with careful craftsmanship. Enslin speaks of the author's daring geni genius. He sees the evidence of his handiwork on every page. It is true that much of Mark consists of earlier material, like stones in a mosaic. But Mark has selected, polished, and arranged his stones with the care of an expert craftsman. The unity of Mark, like the unity of a mosaic, lies in its design. Mark is far from a mere compiler. He deserves to be recognized as an author in his own right, a man of real imagination, a creator and an artist. When one perceives the care with which his plot has been constructed, and the precision with which each piece has been fitted into the whole, it is impossible to refer to his gospel as a hastily thrown together collection of traditional anecdotes. While it was written in the midst of crisis and therefore under pressure, it shows that it was composed according to a carefully laid plan. We recall that Shakespeare also wrote rapidly and under pressure, but still produced plays of tremendous power. I saw everything that Mark Prophet did in this life be produced under pressure. The pressure under the ongoingness of the divine plan. It moves. And the plan is moving so fast across the cosmos. It is a certain degree of creative tension and pressure that is the only thing that enables us to keep up with it. While it was written, the, the work of Mark, brief though it is, is worthy to be compared to classical Greek drama and it is safe to say that his story of the suffering Son of God has moved people as no Greek tragedy has ever done. Mark's gospel is not only a treasure of the infant church, it is a majestic piece of literature. Now that conclusion comes to us 
after centuries of the opposite view by theologians. That conclusion. It has taken 2,000 years, although perhaps a few along the way have said it, but it has taken the evolution of Christ within the individual, the evolution of the emphasis on Jesus as a man of works that we can do also. It's taken the violet flame. When I was in college at Boston University School of Theology taking a course on these Gospels, there was a big putting down of Mark. And I was left with that impression all these years that he was somehow inferior, just the way there's the big putting down of Longfellow among poets. He's hardly taught and read today, but ridiculed. Why? Simplicity. Fallen ones want to complexify everything. Gets too simple, and people criticize it. So with this fresh research, I realized that that entire momentum is a condemnation on the one book, together with John, in which we can find the real mysteries of Jesus Christ. I commend you all to read the Gospel of Mark, to read it and study it in terms of the harmony of the Gospels. We could spend an entire three months teaching the Bible at Summit University. It grieves me that first quarter is not a full year because it takes that full year and more. It takes a four-year full course to study the scriptures of the world's religions and the teachings we've given. Beloved mighty I am presence, beloved Christ self, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we call to beloved Jesus and Kathumi world teachers. We call to you beloved Lanello and Del Moria, beloved Saint Germain. We ask that you place within our hearts now the great gift of wisdom and understanding and compassion whereby we might deliver according to the will of God and the fervor of our hearts the true understanding of the message of Jesus Christ, Gautama Buddha, Mother Mary, Archangel Michael, Sanat Kumara, Lord Maitri, and all of the avatars, blessed Zarathustra. I call for the light within Almighty God to expand the light within these hearts. Expand now and let this light go forth to give the absolute understanding of the mission of Jesus Christ to the whole wide world. Beloved Mark, Beloved Saint Mark, beloved Vanello, let this mantle and your roaring lion be upon us now as we carry forward this word and this understanding of the works of God in Christ Jesus and in us. Truly, let it be our motto. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. 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 Now we can roar about the weather, okay? <laughs> roar! Missed for lunch. You can roar for your lunch now. <laughs> roar!